Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Mike Westerdahl from CriticalBench.com, and um, I've got Lee Hayward on the phone right now from uh, LeeHayward.com, his uh, blog, Total Fitness Bodybuilding, as well. And um, Lee is actually an amateur competitive bodybuilder, and the topic that we're going to talk about today is um, pre-contest dieting and how the dieting for many bodybuilders has almost come full circle. So that's the topic of today's interview. Um, Thanks a lot for uh, taking the call. Lee's awesome. He's a you know a real live expert, not just one of these internet guys. He loves helping people. He does this in real life, and I'm really glad to have him uh, do this interview for us. Welcome, Lee. All right, thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. Cool. So, why don't you give uh, people that aren't familiar with you just a quick background on uh, on yourself and, and your business and your uh, competition history? Yeah, sure. I mean, like you said, I, I do this. This is my passion. Bodybuilding is something that I love, and it's. I've been weight training since I was 12 years old, and it started for me back when I first seen Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Conan the Barbarian movies. When I seen that, I just knew, hey, I got to look like that someday. I was just blown away. So that was my initial motivation to start, you know, searching for information and figure out this whole bodybuilding thing. And since then, I mean, I've been competing and training. Uh, I actually did my first bodybuilding show when I was 17 years old. I'm still in high school, and I've pretty much competed every year since. And it's, wow. yeah, so it's something that I've just been very passionate about. And I started my first uh, website uh, online actually in 1997 and t- helping people, teaching people what I learned through bodybuilding and competition and stuff. And it's, that's what I do today. I mean, that's just continued on from there. So it's, again, like you mentioned, my website, LeeHayward.com. And that's my passion. That's what I like to do is just get out there and interact with people and help, the, I guess, the average Joe to extre- achieve above average gains with their bodybuilding training. So like I say, that's what we're going to talk about here today. That's awesome. So what are we talking like? How many years online is that? 97 to now? I mean, we started around around the same time. It's been yeah. a while now. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, we're, once you get over a decade, that's it. You're, you're an old time around the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're talking uh, pre-contest for a bodybuilding show, but... I'm wondering if there's other people listening to this interview that want to get in shape for a specific date or event. Could they use some of these strategies as well, or is this strictly just for competing? You know, the same principles apply regardless of what your fat loss goals are. I mean, if you just want to get in shape for a beach vacation or you want to get in shape for a high school reunion or if you've got a wedding coming up or anything like that, the same principles apply. Uh, in fact, very often if you're goals are more, I guess, everyday and more modest, like say get in shape for a beach vacation, that's not as extreme as getting ready for a bodybuilding show. So very often you'll actually be able to achieve those goals a lot easier. So I mean, you'll actually follow similar, you know, types of training, similar nutrition program and that, but you'll be able to get to what we consider a lean physique much quicker than you would be able to get to like a stage ready competitive physique. Okay, so like a lean beach ready physique, that's looking good for the beach, you can kind of mm-hmm. see the abs, but then getting on stage, that's that's one more notch up. That's where you got to be absolutely stage ready, getting every muscle compared to other competitors. That's taking it to one step further. Yeah, and then that's the way I like to actually structure my whole training. I do it in phases. So, I mean, the phase to go like fat to lean, that's one area. I mean, to go from lean to contest ripped, like I said, that's taking it up to another level altogether. And we'll How would you know where, what your baseline, what you're starting at? Because um, you're talking about going from fat to lean. What if you're, <laughs> I mean, what if you just, uh, you know, you wouldn't call yourself fat, but you're not exactly ripped yet. I mean, how long does it take? Or how, like, what's the first phase? Let's, let's start with that. Well, most guys who are training consistently, you know, they're working out regularly. Typically, they probably have somewhere in the vicinity of, say, like 15 to 20 percent body fat. And that's where a lot of the regular gym goers are. Now, obviously, if you're 
heavier than that, I mean, you're what we would consider like pushing fat or even obese, then obviously you need just regular diet training just to get yourself down to that base level. But the typical off-season bodybuilder is somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 percent body fat. And that's a good range to be in to start looking at what you'd need to do to get ready for a competition. Okay. That's, so let's say you're at 15 to 20 percent body fat. Mm-hmm. What would, how much time do you think you would need? At that stage, I like to give yourself plenty of time, so I would start preparing six months in advance. So if you want to be in shape for a particular date, just literally break out the calendar and work your way back, and you want to give yourself six solid months of training to get to the point where you're ripped. Okay, and training and dieting as well? Yes, yeah. Now, what would what would be the very first thing you do when you start? Do you just kind of go cold turkey and just start getting on a strict diet right away, or do you, you mentioned phases? Yeah, I mean, the first phase, what I would do is break it down month by month. And the easy way to go about it is <laughs> the first phase, I mean, clean up your diet. Obviously, people, it doesn't take rocket scientists to know what's a healthy diet and what's an unhealthy diet. I mean, if it comes through a drive through window or if it gets delivered to your house by a delivery driver, chances are it's probably not good for you. So, I mean, just cutting out the junk, cutting out the, the takeout and the fast food and the sweets and things like that and focusing on just natural, wholesome, good quality food. I mean, that's the first step right okay. there is just clean that out. And in addition to that, I would like to increase your cardio. So, depending on how much cardio you do, I mean, you just want to up that a bit. I mean, a lot of guys, a lot of off-season bodybuilders probably don't even do any cardio. So, I mean, a simple three-day-a-week cardio routine just to get your body, you know, moving towards the the final outcome. I mean, so you're just taking a little baby step for the first month, clean up the diet and up the cardio. Now, do you care what kind of cardio people do or as long as they're doing something? It doesn't really matter. I mean, when it comes to fat loss, cardio is just a a supplement to the weight training. I mean, the weight training is your priority, and the cardio is just a little extra that you're going to do to help burn the body fat. So, I mean, if you want to do cardio machines at the gym, that's fine. If you want to go for a walk or a jog, that's fine. Bicycle ride, it really doesn't matter as long as you're doing it consistently. Okay. Now, you also said cleaning out all the junk. Let's say mm-hmm. everyone does that. Now, um, what about Sundays for football or something like that? Or, I mean, I've read a lot of diets online where they have strategic cheat days and things like that. Is that not even in the question yet? That's just something you're yeah. cleaning out completely for now? Well, I mean, if you wanted to have a, a cheat meal here and there, I mean, you could certainly do that, especially in the early phases. But again, I would have that planned out in advance. And I'll give you a little strategy. This is something that I uh, have used myself when it comes to cheating. Is I like to save the cheat meal for later in the day. And this is kind of goes against some conventional wisdom. A lot of people say, hey, you know, you should cheat earlier in the day and because your metabolism is faster and you're probably going to burn those calories off more. But I find that if you start your day cheating, it's, it's like, well, I just blew the day. And it's easier to keep cheating throughout the day. Mm. Whereas if you start your day clean and you know, hey, well, later on this evening, I'm going to have a cheat meal. I'm going to go to a restaurant or, you know, we're going to have pizza for dinner or something like that. Then you can keep yourself clean and on track all day. And overall, there's less damage done and you still get the cravings out of your system. So I find that saving your cheat meal for later in the day works well for a lot of people because it's yeah, less that's junk. Yeah, a good tip. So, yeah. I don't know why, but my cravings are always like around dinner or later is when it's the hardest. Mm-hmm. That might just be a personal thing. I don't know if other people are like that too. But it's, not, it's not like in the morning you just wake up and like crave pancakes or something. <laughs> but it's like at night yeah. you, might, you might want like some pizza or something on once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's the way it is. I think it's because people tend to be, you know, you wake up and you're busy in the morning and you're you're doing all kinds of things. And then later in the evening when you kind of sit back to relax, that's when you start thinking about food. <laughs> right? It's just a, yeah. yeah. So the key is just don't think about food. Stay busy. Yeah. Stay busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you, you get plenty of food. It's not like people hear the word dieting and they 
think it means you're starving yourself or, you know, punishing yourself by not getting enough food. I mean, you're eating a lot of food actually in order to be building this muscle. It's just the kinds of food that you're eating. Could you kind of break that down a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, during the early, this initial phase, this cleanup phase, I mean, we're still going to be eating lots of quality protein, you know, foods such as chicken, beef, fish, eggs, dairy. I mean, you're going to meet your protein needs. Still going to be consuming lots of starchy carbohydrates, you know, things like uh, rice, potatoes, pasta, things like that, and lots of green vegetables. So, I mean, salad vegetables, steamed vegetables. I mean, when it comes to veggies... Uh, the more the better. But whenever I sit down to a meal, I always think of my plate as thirds. So a third protein, third carbohydrates, and a third green vegetables. And that's a a good benchmark to go by. Now what about uh, fats? And fats, you know, I I do believe in supplementing my diet with healthy fat. I mean, I'm a big believer in taking fish oil supplements. And fish oil is, in my opinion, one of the best fatty acid supplements that you can take because it's high in omega-3s and uh, so like I said I take that with my main meals like breakfast, lunch, dinner I usually supplement fish oil and I'm also a big believer in eating just healthy fat in general like obviously eating whole fish like fatty fish stuffs like uh, salmon, mackerel things like that and I'll also have olive oil olive Uh, raw almonds, little things like that that I'll snack on to help uh, increase my healthy fat intake. You mentioned some dairy too, so I mean you get get some fat with that as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. And that's stuff that I will have, like say, in this early phase of the diet. We're not going too strict yet, so we're still eating all the normal food, just cutting out the stuff that everybody knows is junk food. (laughs) That's what we're cutting. Now, how many phases did you did you kind of break this down into? This was phase one. Yeah, this is phase one, and then basically, as you s- progress with the diet, you're going to gradually get stricter in the terms of, you know, being more restrictive with your eating and gradually increasing your cardio. So, and this is kind of, this will vary depending on the individual's progress. I mean, someone who has more fat to lose, they'll probably need to tighten things up sooner, and someone who's has less to lose. I mean, someone who's more naturally lean, they can kind of stay with this phase for a while. Okay. Yeah, so I will customize things based on somebody's body type as well. So um, so the next phase, when what gets stricter? Just adding well, more cardio and then does anything change with the diet? The next phase that I would work up to is strategically timing your carbohydrates throughout the day. So first off, we're going to be upping our cardio. And one thing that I like to do when I'm in a a fat loss phase is I like to start my day with some early morning cardio. I mean, I usually do cardio first thing in the morning before eating. And that's, you know, that's a, a pretty common thing among competitive bodybuilders. It's just been shown to be a great time to tap into stored body fat and it helps to give your metabolism a boost for the day. So I'll start off doing some cardio in the morning and then for breakfast, right after cardio, I'll have a high protein, high carb meal. I mean, for me, it could be something like uh, oatmeal and egg whites. Then for all the midday meals, there'll be high protein, lower carb and high vegetable. So things, maybe a chicken breast and a salad, uh, protein shakes. I mean, all high-protein but low-carb foods throughout the midday. Then in the afternoon, you know, early evening, around that time is when I usually hit the gym and do my weight training workout. And right after the weight training workout, I'll have another high-protein, high-carb meal. So a typical meat and potatoes meal after training. And then if I eat anything later at night, again, it'll be high-protein, low-carb. And I mean, if somebody works out, most people working work out either before work or after work. So since you're getting those carbs after the workout, mm-hmm. in either case, your breakfast had some carbs in it and your, and your post-workout meal had some carbs in it. So it wouldn't matter really whether you got your workout in in the morning or in the evening. The meals afterwards would be the same. Yeah, that's That's right. I mean, like some people obviously like to work out first thing in the morning, do their weight training workout, that is. And if you do that, that's fine because you can still have your high carbs for breakfast. And then what I'd recommend in that case is if you're doing weight training in the morning, then do an extra cardio session 
you know, in the afternoon. So maybe okay. if you get off work, go for a bicycle ride, a walk, a jog, or something, just to get some extra cardio in. And then the same thing would apply. Have your high carb meal. After now, would you, you still um, still have that breakfast after weight training, or would or would you eat something before you go? If you were to work out in the morning. That's kind of an individual thing. I mean, some people find that they can work out and, and train on an empty stomach. And, and if that works great, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But if you're one of those people who just have to have something, you can't work out on an empty stomach, then, you know, maybe a protein shake and a piece of fruit about a half yeah, hour I mean, beforehand. A, a simple sugar, that's a great time to have it because you're just going to burn right through it in the workout anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the exception I'd make for someone who's uh, doing weight training first thing in the morning. I mean, they can't eat beforehand because obviously weight training is more intense than cardio, and it's going to, like I say, you're going to be burning up those carbohydrates. Yep. Okay, cool. So where where have you picked up some of your um, contest nutrition dieting tips? I mean, you had a coach when you started out and stuff, and I know you've read a ton of things. Like, who are some of your mentors, yeah. or where did you pick up some of your strategies from? You know, like, I've studied a lot, and like like you mentioned, I did, uh, for one of my earlier shows, I mean, I, I have hired coaches, and I have uh, consulted with a lot of experienced competitors over the years, so I do pick up a lot of tips and tricks from uh, just, you know, talking with other competitive bodybuilders, but I've studied a lot of information over the years. And some some of the stuff that I've studied, uh, you know, really old school things like the old Beverly International diet. I mean, I've I've studied that, and then I've studied some of the more, I guess, newer diet plans, these higher carb, uh, lower fat diet plans. And then, you know, I've also studied some stuff that other, like say, contest gurus that are out there have put out. Like I say, there's some similarities that you see throughout these programs. And one thing that I've noticed is your body type will really influence the type of diet plan that will work well for you. And okay. I've found that people with an ectomorph build, the naturally leaner build, they can get away eating more carbs on their diets. Uh, I've known some guys who are ectomorphs, and they literally eat carbs with every single meal, and they're still getting, you know, contest ripped. It's just because they have such rapid, fast metabolisms. But people with more of a mesomorphic or an endomorphic type of physique, they tend to work better with lower carbs. That's what I've found. This is kind of off topic, but do you think people's body type changes? Because I know that when I was a teenager, I was a really hard, hard gainer. But now it, it feels a lot harder to, to lose fat than it was. But back then I had, couldn't gain muscle for the life of me. Now gaining muscle is easy, but losing fat's harder. Right. And I, I agree with that. I mean, I can relate to that myself. I mean, when I started training, you know, my early teens and stuff, I had... The, the typical ectomorph type physique, I mean, I could eat and eat and just never gain a pound. I mean, no matter how much food I stuffed in my face, it just wasn't, wasn't going to gain anything. And then what I found is as I got a little older and my metabolism slowed down, I went through a few years where I was right in the sweet spot where all of a sudden I could eat and now the food was helping to fill out my physique and I made some really good muscle gains and then as I got a little older this this sweet spot I found for me was around my late teens early 20s during that time frame I that was my really sweet spot gains. too yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. made some awesome gains and then as I got into my late 20s and now early 30s I find I'm on the other side of the coin where okay I got to be more conservative because when I overeat it goes right to the stomach so I think a lot of guys can relate to that all right we're in the same boat then yeah <laughs> now if we look back at some of these old bodybuilding plans I mean I don't know when the first bodybuilding show but if I'm looking back to the 50s back when Vince Gironda had had Vince's gym and he trained a lot of the bodybuilders and I believe Frank Zane was one of the guys that went to his gym but um hmm? You know, he was one of the first guys that said the reason Americans are getting fat is because they're eating too many carbohydrates. And he wasn't talking about vegetables or things like that. No. But he, he, you know, was a big advocate of people eating healthy fats and proteins. He actually said you couldn't digest protein without having the fats. 
But then we kind of hit this trend. I would say the time when I was growing up as a teenager and reading the magazines in the 80s and 90s, things like that, it's like fat was the enemy. Fat made you get fat. And there's so many people that still think that. They think that when you eat fat, it makes you fat. They think it causes high cholesterol and heart attacks and all these other things. But there's been a lot of, it seems like it's gone full circle again, back to things that they were saying in the old days that, you know, you do need fats and it's healthy for you. And a lot of the bodybuilding diets now are starting to include the fats and not making them such an enemy. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, when you actually look at, you know, you break food down into components. I mean, we have uh, protein, which is made up of amino acids and there's essential amino acids that you have to consume and then when you look at fat I mean there's essential fatty acids that you have to consume but when you look at carbohydrates there are no essential carbohydrates I mean you can literally survive on protein and fat you know that's so when you look at what's essential by your body I mean those are the two things that we need to have is we need to have protein we need to have fat we don't necessarily have to have carbohydrates Right. Yeah. So, um, getting back on track again with the phases, uh-huh. where yeah. the next phase we kind of covered starting out, the next thing to fine tune. I mean, is that something you just gradually fine tune more and more and more up until a certain point, or are there are a few more tweaks, or do you start getting into like the final few weeks before the show? Yeah, sure. I'll take it. I mean, how I'd like to run through this is monitor the results that the individual is getting. So, I mean, if somebody starts cleaning up their diet and they see some great results, but then eventually that's going to plateau. I mean, they're going to, just from cleaning up your diet, I mean, that's not going to work forever. And then, like, say, you get into the timed carb meals where we're eating carbs after exercise and doing more cardio and things like that, and that's going to work for a while, but eventually you're going to plateau at that. And the next phase that I would put somebody through once that hits a plateau is I go through a carb cycle diet. And this is something that I go into a lot of detail in my uh, competition prep book, uh, which is called Your First Bodybuilding Competition. But basically it's a, a a rotational carb cycle diet where you go two days of eating high carbs, and that's carbs with every single meal. Two days of eating medium carbs, which is just carbs after exercise, so carbs with breakfast, carbs with dinner. And then two days of low carbs, where there's no starchy carbs whatsoever. So every meal is just lean protein, healthy fat, and green vegetables. And I go through that rotational diet. And again, depending on somebody's physique, that might be enough for them to get in contest shape. I've seen guys, like say, with the ectomorph physique, actually get ripped on this rotational diet. Uh, Someone who has a bit more fat to lose, uh, again, they may reach a plateau after uh, several weeks of this diet and they need to step it up to even a higher level. (laughs) Okay, this was called My First Bodybuilding Show? Uh, Your First Bodybuilding Show. Okay. Your First Bodybuilding Competition is called. Okay, where can they get more information about that if they want to get into this a lot deeper than just what we're talking about on the interview? Yeah, I mean, I have that available right on my website, leehayward.com, and it's also available on amazon.com as well. However, if they order it through my website, it also comes along with a seminar DVD that I did at one of our local bodybuilding shows where I actually explain a lot of this stuff in more detail. So, okay, and this is an actual the, phys- physical book, right? Yes, it is. This is a hard copy book that's sent to the mail and a hard copy DVD. So, like I say, it's available right on my website, leehayward.com. Sweet. Now, are you taking any supplements during this whole time? You mentioned the um, the fish oils. What about protein mm-hmm. shakes or any kind of creatine or anything like that? Anything you'd recommend for people? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to protein, I almost don't even consider that a supplement. I just kind of consider that part of my diet. Uh, to me, I mean... Protein is, is in the kitchen, like say that goes right along with meat, fish, chicken, eggs. I mean, all the your protein foods. I mean, protein supplements go right along with that, in my opinion. Um, so I'm a big fan of whey protein. I usually use a whey protein isolate. That's my protein supplement of choice. 
And as far as you mentioned creatine, I actually use creatine year-round. I take it when I'm in my off-season, and I also take it when I'm dieting for fat loss because it helps to maintain your lean muscle, maintain your strength while you're losing body fat. You know, a lot of people think that creatine is going to cause you to retain water and that, and in a way it does, but it helps to retain water within the muscle cells themselves. So it's going to help to keep your muscles fuller and stronger as you lose body fat. And that's something I do right throughout my, uh, my fat loss diet. And it's something I recommend to all my coaching students as well. Okay. Yeah. Reminds me, i got to order some more. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And uh, another supplement that I'm a huge fan of and works really well is uh, the ephedrine and caffeine stack. I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard of that before. And that's uh, something that I take before exercise. I take that before my cardio workouts and, again, before my weight training workouts. And that's great for helping to increase your metabolism, helps to curb your appetite, boost energy levels. So it's it's not going to do it's not going to cause you to lose body fat in itself, but it's a great crutch to take along with a fat loss diet to help make the process a little easier. And do you do that year round too, or just when you're training? Just when I'm show? dieting for fat loss. Yeah, it's uh, the ephedrine caffeine stack. I mean, it is a powerful uh, supplement stack, and that's something that I will just save for when I'm in fat loss mode. Now, do you buy a pre-made off a supplement company, or do you mix it yourself? Uh, no, I just actually buy the pure ephedrine and the pure caffeine, and I take that, you know, separately like that. How much, like, what's a good normal dose of the, each? The typical dose for the ephedrine caffeine stack is 25 milligrams of ephedrine and 200 milligrams of caffeine. And there's a way that you can even uh, kick this up uh, another notch, and that's by adding some green tea extract to this as well. Uh, green tea has its own fat-burning properties, and it's very healthy, but it also helps to prolong the effects of ephedrine and caffeine, so it actually lasts longer in your system, so you get more bang for your buck out of it. Okay. And you know, if the, I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., a lot of the ephedrine fat burners are banned, so you can't buy them. I'm wondering if there's any um, so any good fat burners on the market that are worth using if you can't just buy the regular ephedrine. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a, a gray area in Canada, but it is legally available. And uh, like I say, where, where this is a private interview, we can talk freely. But basically, uh, they're not allowed <laughs> yeah. to sell ephedrine as a fat burner. They're only allowed to sell it as a nasal decongestant. So as long as it's sold as a nasal decongestant, it is legal in Canada. But if anybody labels it as a fat burner or a, you know, physique enhancements, anything like that, it's automatically disallowed. So you can buy it as okay. a decongestant. And in fact, that's something that I've actually carry on my website as well. I mean, if anybody wanted to uh, order that, I actually ship a uh, ephedrine and caffeine to some of my friends in the U.S. and some of my coaching students as well, because like say they can order it in for personal use as a nasal decongestant. <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> There's a lot of stuffed up people in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, can't you, hear, can't you hear me? I think I got some allergies right now. Yeah. Yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's that's the that's the deal with the uh, ephedrine and caffeine stack. Okay, cool. Hmm? And then what if we get back to the diet again? Yeah, sure. All right, so we covered this, the supplements. I mean, those, what I just mentioned there, are the foundational supplements. I mean, you can still, okay. if somebody wants to take, uh, you know, vitamins. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of that. I take, like, my multivitamins and uh, take extra B vitamins and vitamin C and things like that. But, again, that's just stuff that I take year-round for overall health. I mean, they're not necessarily fat loss specific. Uh, that's uh, that's the supplements side of it. Again, we're getting back to the whole uh, carb rotational diet that I mentioned earlier. You know, right. two days high carb, two days medium carb, two days low carb. That, again, depending on somebody's metabolism and where they are, that may be enough for somebody to get in contest shape. And it's pretty interesting because I'm actually coaching some people right now uh, getting ready for a, a local bodybuilding show. And I have two bodybuilders that I'm coaching. And I started them off with the same type of diet plan. 
and I just tweak it based on the results. So they went through these phases, you know, just a cleaning up phase. Then they went through the the carbs uh, after exercise phase, and then they went through the carb rotational phase. And one guy is getting phenomenal results. He has more of an ectomorphic physique, and he's right on track for coming in ripped. Whereas the other guy has more of a more of a mesomorphic slash endomorphic physique. He has more body fat to lose, and he started to plateau with that. So what I put him on then was even a lower carb diet, where literally every day was a low carb day, except for a couple strategic uh, high carb meals throughout the week. And this goes back to the old school Beverly International diet. You know, I mean, this is something that I'm sure like Vince Gironda recommended back in the day as well. I mean, they were big advocates of the low carb diet. Okay. Now, what yeah. kind of training goes along with this? I mean, not to get into too specifics, but I mean, if you're not getting very many carbs at all, that's a lot of your energy, but the ephedrine and the caffeine supplement, that gives you the energy mm-hmm. to get through the workouts and get your cardio done. But are you you're talking about like high intensity, heavy weight type workouts, or do you go into more of a, a volume type routine to, you know, really just work the muscles with lighter weights or does your training change? Uh, the training will change as you get leaner. Um, once your body adapts to you know, being on a restricted uh, caloric intake and you're consuming less carbs, it'll start to burn more fat for fuel. And the transition, like if somebody has just switched, say, to a low-carb diet, for the first week or so, they're going to feel like crap. You know, their energy is going to be low. They're going to feel totally flat and depleted and feel moody and everything else. And this is usually what tricks a lot of people into thinking, oh, I can't eat low carbs and it doesn't work, is that initial first week or so, you know, maybe a week to 10 days. And a lot of people just can't last that long where their body is in this transitional phase where it's primarily burning sugar for fuel and to burning fat for fuel. But if you can stick it out and let your body actually switch over, you'll find that your energy and your muscle fullness and everything else is actually pretty good, even despite the fact that you're eating lower carbs. You can actually get a decent workout in once your body switches to primarily burning fat for fuel. Okay. And so, you mean... Seems like it's like that with a lot of things, just getting used to yep. something for a couple of weeks and mm-hmm. almost getting it to a habit. I mean, you're talking about the body changing, but there's also something to be said about just the habit of something as well. Once you just get used to it and get past that uh, first little barrier and then you can just go with it. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the first phase, you know, the first transition here, you've got to rely on some willpower, right? I mean, you have to <laughs> force it out. But after that, then it gets easier. You know, you actually start to enjoy uh, consuming less carbs, and you're not going to be as hungry. In fact, you'll find that your appetite stays pretty consistent when you're on a lower carb diet because you're not getting the blood sugar <coughs> and the spikes that you normally get when you consume carbs with every meal. So you find that that's your energy levels kind of stabilize. And uh, you can get some good workouts in, but the way it is, I like to play it by ear. I mean, obviously, if you're feeling strong and energetic, then you can push it hard in the gym. And if you're feeling a bit beat down and a bit tired, then obviously I'd probably do some lighter exercises, more isolation moves. I mean, still want to train consistently, but obviously you're not going to push it super hard if you're not feeling energetic. Yeah. Now, you talked about timing of carbs and things like that. What about... um? Do you have a cutoff time where you just don't eat after a certain time of day? Uh, Not really, because this is going to depend on your schedule and when you work out and everything else. I mean, if somebody works out late in the evening, then there's nothing wrong with having, you know, post-workout carbs late in the evening, you know, if you're in that phase where you're having carbs after exercise. So I'll definitely recommend that. Uh, But again, it, it all depends to your individual schedule. So if you work out you know, in the afternoon, you had your post-workout carbs then, then obviously you wouldn't have them later in the evening as well. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of a personal question, but so, let's say I got my evening workout and then dinner at 7 o'clock, but then I stay up late working or something. I mean, there could be a good five, six hours before I'm going to bed till after dinner. Well, a good uh, snack to have like after dinner, but maybe an hour or two before going to bed. You kind of go into the kitchen and looking for something. Sure. I mean, right here is when you'd have uh, protein, uh, vegetables, 
healthy fat. You know, you want high nutrient food, but low carbohydrates. You know, you don't want the extra carbs there. Uh, I'll give you a, a recipe that I like to have, and this is healthy and tasty and can help satisfy those late night cravings. And what I like to do is I'll, uh, in the blender, mix up one cup of egg whites, one scoop of protein powder, and then blend in some frozen berries, like frozen strawberries, as well as some mixed frozen veggies, like, you know, bags of frozen broccoli and cauliflower okay. and carrots. And when you blend it all up, I mean, it, it's literally a smoothie, but when you blend it all up together, it masks the taste of the vegetables. So, I mean, you're still getting a serving of vegetables there and adding volume to your smoothie without actually tasting the vegetables because it's masked. That's always good, co covering the taste of the vegetables. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could do like a scoop of the greens powder too, right? If you wanted to, you could throw in greens powder there as well. And I like to mix up these uh, blender smoothies really thick. I mix them up so thick that I actually eat them with a spoon. So it's like uh, sitting down to a bowl of frozen yogurt or something like that. That's what kind of the texture you get. And that can help satisfy your late night cravings and you're still just filling your body up with high nutrient food. Yeah, I think that, that's got to be the trick, making it thicker. Because if you just make it like a drink, you don't really feel like you no. hit the spot. Yeah, there's, there's no eating satisfaction with a drink, but if you can sit down, you know, with a, a spoon and feel like you're eating a blender full of frozen yogurt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. it helps to satisfy the cravings. Okay, I mean, cool. Could, cool risk. Yep. So what um what body fat level do you want to be at when you're uh, getting ready for the show, when it's almost time? Well, the benchmark that I use when I'm uh, coaching somebody is by three months out, by the 12-week out mark, you want to have visible abs. And that's, you know, you want to be able to see your six-pack by three months out. And if you're at that stage, then you're on track for coming into the contest in ripped shape. Now, for a lot of people who are just into general fat loss, I mean, if they could just get six-pack abs, I mean, that would be the goal right there. But for a competitive bodybuilder, the six-pack abs is like, that's the first step to getting ripped. Because the way the abs work is they're usually the easiest place to gain fat, and they're also the easiest place to lose fat. Uh, the fat around your stomach is like is very active. So, I mean, when you're following a good strict diet, cardio, and everything else, you can typically lose fat around the stomach fairly quickly. Uh, so that's the first place that you want to notice it. You want to have visible abs three months out and then diet down from there to get contest shredded. Okay. Now, do you do any tweaks? Does anything change right before the show? Like how far out? Do you do anything drastic like a couple of weeks before? You know, this is something that you hear a lot of competitors talk about, you know, what do you do? How do you peak for the show? And the simple answer to this is I don't do anything drastic. Uh, I like to diet right on through to the show, and it's much more predictable this way. It's much more safe this way. I mean, there's nothing anybody can really do within a week or so that's going to make a huge difference in how they look. It really comes down to the overall diet and training and just getting in shape early. Uh, but what I will do, I guess, to help ensure that you're not retaining water the day of the show and things like that is prior to the show, so like one week out from the show, I'll start increasing my water intake. So I, I purposely try to double up on my water intake. So I'm just constantly drinking water, going to the bathroom, peeing it out, drinking water, yeah. going to the bathroom, peeing it out. And it gets annoying, but like I say, you do that for the final week and just get your body used to flushing a lot more water. And then what I do is then Friday night, because most shows are on a Saturday, so Friday night, the night before the show, I will cut my water. And so you're all of a sudden you have this high flow of water and then you just cut it. Your body's still releasing water at the old rate, but you're not putting it back. So it just helps to flush the water from under the skin and gives you a tight, dry look for the Saturday, the day of the show. But uh, again, I'm not a, a big fan of doing anything drastic or taking diuretics or anything of that nature. I like to do things simple and natural. Okay. Do you, is there anything you well, specific or different you would eat on the day of the show just to have like some energy or to make the muscles pop out more or anything like that? Yeah, yes, there is. I mean, one thing that 
I would do, I mean, you hear some guys talk about carb depleting, carb loading. Uh, I've tried a lot of that in the past, and it's very hit or miss. Now, I mean, some people may have nailed it down to the point where they can actually make it work, but for new competitors, it's something that I definitely would not recommend because it's too, uh, it's too unpredictable. I mean, because depending on how your body reacts, you consume carbs, it may fill you out, but at the same time, it may cause you to what they call spill over, and, and that is just retain water and actually look puffier and smoother than if you didn't carb up. So I don't like to do anything in that nature of carving up. I just stick to my diet right throughout the show. However, on the day of the show itself, once your water is cut, then you can be a little bit more generous with the carbs. Uh, one thing that I've actually experimented with and has worked really well is right before hitting the stage, like say within a, a half hour, 45 minutes before hitting the stage, is having some simple sugars. So like literally uh, something like a candy bar about half hour to 45 minutes before hitting the stage. And that can help to, again, spike your insulin levels, but it helps to uh, drive some sugar into your system. And this can help to bring out vascularity and make your muscles look a bit fuller and harder. And there's no risk of spilling over at this stage because your water is cut. So, I mean, if there's no water, no excess water in your system, it's not going to get stored and bloated under the skin. Okay, so this cool. is you can probably tell I've... from my questions that I haven't actually done a show myself. Right. <laughs> but, uh, and... Uh, you know, this this is an advanced thing, but it's common to actually see guys do something like this backstage at a show, like eat uh, simple sugars. I mean, I've known some guys like literally eat breakfast cereal, like a box of Captain Crunch, just to get some fast digesting carbs in them right before hitting the stage, and that helps to, uh, you know, get the extra sugars in you and helps to make your muscles a little bit fuller, a little bit more vascular. But the kicker is, is you want to be very conservative because obviously if you're not drinking a lot of water, it can sometimes be hard to digest a lot of food. And okay. you don't want your belly to bloat. You know, <laughs> I've seen some guys literally go out and eat like a burger and fries. And it's just like sitting in their stomach like a rock and they've got this big distended stomach because they you know, don't have enough water in their system to digest it. <laughs> yeah. Now, without it, without any of that water, is it easy to get cramps and things when you're when you're flexing? It it can be, yeah. It's it's you know the risk of cramping up can be uh, uh, quite high. So there's a another little trick that I've used, especially if you feel a cramp coming on, and that is I literally take a salt packet. And what I mean by those is like if you went to a restaurant like McDonald's or anywhere, and you you know all those little salt packets that they have there, right. salt yep. pepper. I just take a handful of those salt packets and I take them with me, and right, you know, you can just rip open one of those salt packets and just swallow it down. And uh, it's pretty gross, but it helps to keep some sodium in your system and help to prevent cramps. Okay. And that also helps to increase some uh, blood flow because when your sodium levels are too low, it's hard to pump up backstage, hard to keep your muscles full. So that's a little trick that you can do to help keep your muscles fuller and stop cramping. Would there be any <laughs> negative to taking potassium? pills or anything like that? You know, a lot of guys do that, but sodium is the more dominant mineral over potassium, like when it comes to electrolytes. So if your sodium levels are in check, very often your potassium levels follow in suit and they'll be in check as well. So I, I'm, I know from personal experience and from a lot of guys that I've worked with, the, the sodium works better than taking extra potassium. Okay. Yeah. So what, what show do you have coming up? Are you in... Uh contest dieting mode right now yeah i'm actually uh, right now where are we it's just just over six weeks out from a competition right now and uh, that's the newfoundland provincials is coming up uh, november 19th and that's the show i'm oh, training awesome. for right now cool yeah, so so right now in my own training i'm in the phase where i'm in the low carb diet and i have a couple strategic carb meals every week so Every day is basically low carbs, protein, green vegetables, healthy fat. And then every Wednesday night and every Saturday night, I will have a, a carb up meal. And for me, it's usually something along the lines of like oatmeal, sweet potatoes, uh, maybe a bag of air pop popcorn, something like that. Okay. And that's what I'll have 
twice a week just help replenish my glycogen stores and keep my metabolism high. But the rest and then of your, the time your next your next step is going to be the the uh, cycling method. Actually, the cycling method I've already gone through that one. <laughs> okay, all right. So that's the way it goes first. Just if you want to like do a quick recap of the way the diet works. Yeah, could you just recap it real quick for us? Sure. First phase, we're just going to clean up our diet, cut out the junk food, and increase the cardio. Say like three cardio workouts a week. After that, we're going to move into uh, timing our carbs. So we have carbs with breakfast, carbs with dinner, and we're doing cardio pretty much every day. After that, keeping the cardio and the training the same, but we're going to move into a carb cycle diet where it's two days high carbs, two days medium carbs, and two days low carbs, and you just keep rotating through that. And then the final phase, if that's not working for you, then you can move into the low-carb diet, which is basically low carbs every day, and then you just have two carb up meals per week. And I like to space that out. And for me, Wednesday and Saturday works good, but it could be any two days you know, throughout the week, but obviously you space them out so that they're equally spaced. Cool, man. Hey, we really appreciate you just freely sharing this information. Yeah. <laughs> this is like really good stuff, and Lee's just cool enough just to help us out with it. Mm-hmm. But um, I wanted to ask you, too, what happens when the show's over? Like, are you done with this kind of dieting? And then, I mean, does, does the weight come back on rather quickly afterwards, or is this just something you eat this way leading up to a show? Or could you kind of talk about in-season versus off-season or all-year-round type eating or just kind of how you do it. Yeah. Well, ideally, you would not uh, <laughs> pig out after a show, but it can be kind of hard if you've been <laughs> dieting for months on end, and then all of a sudden, okay, now the show's over, I'm free to eat whatever I want. And uh, this can be good and can be bad, because what happens is initially, you know, after a show, if you start pigging out, you can make some really good gains because your body was so depleted, and then all of a sudden you're providing with a surplus of calories, and you can make some really good gains. However, I saw some pictures of you and uh, Dave Rule, the muscle cook, and you had your show, and then like two weeks later, you guys looked like even bigger. Yes, bigger, uh, but the thing is probably retaining a little bit more water. So even though it looked bigger and probably more impressive, say like if you were on a beach or something like that, it wouldn't be quite as hard, quite as ripped. Okay, so like you wouldn't have done as good in the competition, but it, but it looked pretty cool <laughs> two weeks later. Yeah, yeah, you do fill out considerably. And the thing is, that that's the, the benchmark right there, is this two-week window of opportunity right after uh, a you know, strict diet where you can really make some good gains. And uh, if somebody wanted to kind of capitalize on this year-round, uh, myself and a friend of ours, Vince Del Monte, actually put out a program called the 21-Day Fast Mass Building. And it's actually based on the whole principle of this post-contest rebound that bodybuilders experience. You know, after they dieted down for a show and they're so depleted, then all of a sudden they are free to eat whatever they want and all this surplus of calories can really help to skyrocket your anabolic hormones and help make some really good muscle gains. But after about a two-week period, he's, you know, has had enough and it's kind of like that's the turning point where now you're going to burn or sorry, store more of those calories as excess fat rather than gaining lean muscle. Yeah, I've read so, about that too, kind of a uh, yeah. like anabolic cycling mm-hmm. method too. But uh, if anybody wants to check that out, if you go to Lee's blog, LeeHayward.com, and then you click products in the navigation, I believe that program is listed on that page too if anybody wants it, to learn more about it. It is. Yep. And that's that's something, if somebody wanted to capitalize on this, you know, it's basically cycling through uh, phases of low calorie and phases of high calorie where you can uh, maximize lean muscle gains. And that's a, an alternative for somebody to do in the off season if they wanted to. Yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Anything else you, we wanted to add in? Otherwise, I think that kind of wraps things up. I mean, that's, uh, like I said, that's the, the dieting portion of uh, getting ready for a bodybuilding show. Now, I mean, when it comes to actually competing, there's a lot of little nitty-gritty details that go into it. I mean, obviously, for you know, a future competitor, they need to think about 
posing and stage presence and how to go about preparing in that sense. And that's some of the, the finer details that I do cover in my program, your first bodybuilding competition. So if anybody was interested in competing someday, certainly uh, I think a must-have book to help put you on the fast track to avoiding a lot of these newbie mistakes that people make. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it would be a shame to be dialed in and ready with your physique just to make some stupid mistakes with with other areas of the competition because yeah. it's just one part of it. Yeah. But this is probably the hardest part of it, don't you think? It is. Oh, yeah. This is now, I don't think it's right the here. most confusing. It's just the hardest to actually follow through and stick with. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not rocket science what you're telling us to do, but to actually no. do it, that that takes some willpower and some dedication and determination. So, but you've got you've got the action plan. Yeah, sure. I mean, like I say, it's everybody. When it comes to getting in shape, I mean, we pretty much know what we have to do. It's just actually <laughs> doing it is the hard part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do you have a program for actually doing it? <laughs> <laughs> that could yeah. be the name of it how to actually do what you're supposed to do that's right I mean, <laughs> alright cool alright Lee we'll catch up with you real soon thanks again for uh, sharing this information with everybody we learned a lot today and I'm going to refer to these notes and see what I can do with my physique as well so thanks a lot for the help and uh, we'll talk to you real soon